Welcome to VLGA Connect, and it's time to head into the newsroom with the CEO of the VLGA, Catherine Arndt, who's got her finger on the pulse of the sector and is going to share some observations with us today. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Chris. How are you? It's good to see you. I think we uh, had another hiatus last week, so it's great to be able to catch up today. An unplanned one, I think, but it, uh, it just ended up being a busy week, didn't it? Oh, it was extraordinarily so, busy. I mean, as it is in local government, there's always something happening. And you've come from, on the weekend, the conference of the Algua Victorian branch. I've got to say, that was all over social media. It looked like a fabulous program. They got some terrific speakers. How was it from someone in the room? Look, I, I'm still coming down from the high that was the Algua Vic conference, and I must congratulate the organisers uh, of that event and the hosts, Algua Vic, but also the city of Yarra. I must say that uh, VJ's team there did an extraordinarily generous job and delivered what could only be des described as an outstanding success. And the speakers were incredible. It was a very, very busy one and a half days, essentially, starting on the Friday evening and followed by a full day on Saturday with um, the new municipal inspector spoke. Um, we have a new shadow minister for local government, David Morris. The member for Mornington is back in that portfolio. He um, came back into that portfolio after Tim um, moved away from it, Tim Smith. Um, uh, just a few weeks ago. So actually, while we're speaking of David, I did catch up with him um, the other day um, and we met face to face, which was terrific. Um, it's good to see face to face meetings happening a little bit more regularly. Um, but going back to the Agua Vic conference, uh, it certainly was an extraordinary event. And the sense of unification in the room, if I can get the words out, was incredibly strong. And uh, I must say I was really humbled with the amount of feedback that I received as CEO of the VLGA for the work that the VLGA does to support the local government sector and also, of course, through our local women, women leading change program, we supported many women who were in that room the other day. Um, so well done. That's terrific. Great to get that feedback as well. And look, I'm, I'm sure the organisers were, were chuffed with the result. Not only that, they got, a, they got a headline news item out of it because the Minister for Local Government, Sean Lean, announced a cultural review of the sector at that conference, didn't he? He did indeed. He presented uh, on the Saturday morning and announced not only some additional funding for Algua Vic to, to help them deliver their uh, well-known mentoring program, and congratulations, Al Wavik, on that. But he also uh, made an announcement about a cultural review into local government. Now, this is something that the Minister and I have discussed on previous occasions, and it comes about, well, from my understanding in conversations with him, looking at the incredibly detailed and legislated governance responsibilities of councillors, how the political system then sort of overlaps that and what sort of tensions or opportunities that perhaps creates for councillors to fulfil their governance responsibilities in a way that would see um, and uphold those highest standards of, of integrity, transparency and good governance. Now, of course, also what falls into that um, is, is that concept of culture and the council itself um, as that board of governance for a council actually setting the culture for the organisation, for the council. And that in itself provides an opportunity for the, the leadership that needs to take place for the sexual harassment report that came out of the Victorian Auditor General's office uh, Vargo, as the manager um, from that audit, emphasised at the conference on the weekend, mm. Vargo, not Vago. I did note that the minister announced this cultural view into, into local government. Um, at the same time, he did refer to the findings in that Auditor General's report. And at this stage, the sector, I think, is still looking for some leadership um, you know, to be demonstrated to see the recommendations from that report implemented. 
And the VLGA certainly um, has indicated to the minister that we uh, will partner in any way that we can um, in this cultural review process. That's terrific. We, we have talked numerous times about, you know, what is the next step? How are we going to move forward from that rather damning report? Um, have you got a sense of how this review is going to be conducted and by whom at this point? No, I, I don't have that information. I My understanding is that the Minister had, had asked local government Victoria to do some scoping work in the first instance to perhaps present a discussion paper that would then be circulated and socialised with key stakeholders in the sector to be refined in a way that would be useful and practical. And from that point, then, um, you know, the, the next steps would be determined. So I think the announcement that we've seen is the beginning of that process. And look, uh, the Minister, Sean Lean, is a good friend of VLGA Connect, so I'm sure when he's ready to talk more about how that's going to work, we've got an open invitation. Absolutely, and he knows that and, and does enjoy coming on the program indeed. The other thing I know that's been keeping you a little bit busy of late is you're uh, one of the 16 members of the new Gender Equality Committee and you've had your first meeting? We did. So GEAC, uh, that's the acronym, Gender Equality Advisory Committee, met, uh, I think it was last week or the week before for the first time. <clears throat> uh, you know, quite thrilled to be part of, of that group and, and sitting alongside some, some really remarkable women who represent quite a diverse um, group in the, in the local government sector. I think still early to, to tell what will come from the group. We, we did start these discussions about what is the work plan, what are the outcomes that we're looking to achieve, and I'm looking forward to, to the next meeting. I think there's a really um, good opportunity for the VLGA to present some of the practical work and strategies that we've um, developed as part of the Local Women Leading Change Program to support gender equality in the local government sector. So I look forward to be able to share some of that with the group. Good to know that you're uh, at the table there for those important discussions, Catherine. Now, there's a couple of media uh, items this week that I wanted to get your thoughts on. Firstly, one from out of the UK, and this is, I guess, in the file of uh, let's be grateful for what we have here in terms of councils still being able to meet uh, virtually if, uh, if need be. Um, a, a council in England, the Hertfordshire uh, Council, has actually taken the, um, uh, the, the very interesting step of going to the High Court to try and get permission to continue having meetings online after this Thursday. So context, uh, some primary legislation last year that allowed councils in the UK to meet remotely because of COVID. Local government elections are happening this week on Thursday. That's when the legislation sunsets. The government says it hasn't got enough time to extend the legislation, so a council took it to court and lost. Um, extraordinary. Extraordinary. When you brought this story to my attention, Chris, I was just flabbergasted. So we have a situation where uh, in, in the UK, the, the I guess it was similar to the sort of the emergency legislation that, that we passed here in Victoria to allow for uh, council meetings to be held virtually. Well, their legislation expires this Thursday and rather than amend it or put back the virtual council meetings onto the legislative agenda, they've said it's too hard, they don't have enough time and a council's gone to the High Court to, to get a ruling, which the, the, the government itself also supported that ruling. Well, that process, process by the looks of it, yes. Getting that. Um, and, and it's come back, sorry, no, you have to meet, continue, you have to meet in person. Now that will cause an extraordinary dilemma for some of those councils in the UK, which we know have up to 70 elected Correct. representatives. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the restrictions are at the moment in the UK, but, but certainly it seems really inconsistent with managing uh, a global health pandemic. It, I noticed the local government association there has said that um, councils will have to find very large external venues to allow all the members to meet in person, because as you say, they, they have huge councils in some 
cases. They're still in the midst of this pandemic. I, I think lockdown measures don't completely come off until June. So you've got this extraordinary situation where you've got brand new councils being elected this Thursday, and they're all going to have to meet in person because the government can't fit in the legislation to extend. Extraordinary. I mean, and, and could you ask the question if, if, if it was tested in a court of law, if the councils do in fact meet in person, will they be breaching any of the current um, social distancing or, or, yeah. or sort of lockdown provisions, whatever yeah. they may be? And I just say that our thoughts do go out to our colleagues over there in the UK. And, and as our viewers would know, we do have a partnership with councils in the, in the UK now, uh, thanks to our collaboration with LGIU. Indeed, yes, our, our thoughts are with them. And let's just count our blessings here that we don't have that, uh, that problem. The other story I thought you might uh, have had a comment on is uh, out of Ballarat this week or last week, where uh, the mayor has made some public statements around the ability of councils to influence the spread of poker machines in their regions. There's an application, I think, to install some additional machines in Ballarat. And of course, this is a subject that the VLGAs very uh, heavily involved in working to minimise the harm from gambling. That's right. Um, interesting story, Chris. And for those viewers who may not know, uh, the VLGA has received funding from the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation for a number of years now to work with councils and their local communities to uh, address or implement ways in which they can reduce harm from poker machines in their community. So what that looks like is that we build community and council capacity to respond to um, applications from licensed gaming machine operators looking to put poker machines uh, in licensed venues in communities. So part of the process, of course, um, requires that the community and the council um, work together to identify what can create harm in the community. And we know that there are millions and millions of dollars um, being spent on poker machines by people who are addicted to poker machines. Now, putting more machines into licensed venues exacerbates that problem and Often um, these license applications go into communities that are more vulnerable than others. So the VLGA does work with councils to try to, to I guess, activate the community or, or build the community capacity and council to respond to the applications, which then get heard, of course, at VCAT and also the um, another long acronym, Victorian Liquor Licensing and regulation commission, but I've probably got that accurate incorrectly. Um, so there is a lot of work still to be done. Um, and there are a number of these applications going on as we speak all across the state at various times. So um, Ballarat's not the only one to raise this issue, but I did notice in this ABC News report um, that the amount of money that goes on pokies in Ballarat is almost the same as the amount of money that's raised in rates by the council. So the rate income is 56 million. Uh, the pokies take 50 million dollars, which is pretty extraordinary. extraordinary. But Brimbank mm -hmm. and Kingston, I think, are two others that have very recently been making um, serious public statements about the harm from pokies in their communities. And it was highlighted during COVID, Chris, when venues, of course, were locked down or closed down as a result mm -hmm. of lockdown and the amount of money that was saved because people couldn't go and play the poker machines was extraordinary. And there is a figure. I don't know it off the top of my head, but we could certainly um, find that out and, and report it in another episode of the VLGA Connect Newsroom. Excellent. Thanks, Catherine. Um, the, some good news this week. You've announced the finalists for the Heart Awards. We have. So our annual Heart Award celebration is being held on Friday the 4th of June. The Heart Awards, or Helping Achieve Reconciliation Together, is an initiative of the VLGA. We then sought to partner with Reconciliation Victoria a number of years ago. So now we deliver this uh, jointly. And we have three award categories. We have a local government category. So we have a number of finalists in that. 
Um, there was a media release that went out the other day, so we might attach that media release to um, this episode of Newsroom. There's a school or early years category and also a community category. So congratulations to all finalists, but also to all nominees. Um, we're blown away every year by the initiatives that local communities and councils are undertaking to, to build and strengthen reconciliation. It's an excellent list of projects, uh, Catherine, as you say, we'll attach that, but I think it's worth just naming the councils that are finalists. It's Ballarat, Banyul, Brimbank, Glen Ira, Hepburn, and Mildura. So they're right across the state. The amount of interest in this um, awards program is, is just incredible. And it's always a lovely uh, awards ceremony. Unfortunately, we couldn't have one last year, but looking forward to the event um, this year. Terrific. We'll talk a lot more about that, I'm sure, between now and the announcement of the winners on the 4th of June. Um, I meant to ask you earlier when we were talking about GIAC, I love that acronym, by the way. It, uh, it, Isn't it? What am I thinking of? I think, I think I'm thinking of an electronics brand. There used to be a brand called TIAC, didn't there? So GIAC is the new... <laughs> <laughs> new term, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, introduction to gender equality in Victoria. So this week you've got a session for uh, council officers on the new act. That's right. We're running a council-specific uh, introduction to the Gender Equality Act in partnership with Gender Equity Victoria. And the reason we're doing that is that local governments, of course, fall under the auspice of the Gender Equality Act. And there are some idiosyncrasies that are particular to the local government sector. So we're rolling out sessions to support councils in their understanding of what those are and what their responsibilities will be. We ran a session last week just for councillors. And I must say, I've been overwhelmed by the amount of um, feedback that I've received from councillors who attended that program and really appreciated the opportunity to hear from the VLGA what the Gender Equality Act meant for the local government sector. So check out our website to find out more about um, these workshops. That's excellent, Catherine. Really pleased to hear that. And upcoming, uh, I know there's some work happening at the moment to put together a global panel for our next international topic of discussion. It's going to be in July, but I'm not sure we've nailed the date down. Have well, we? we haven't finalised that date yet. So our global executive panel discussion, which we uh, host in conjunction with LGIU, will be looking at the impacts of COVID on children and young people. So we have the CEO of Aberdeen uh, City Council um, joining us for this panel. And we'll also have our Victorian Child Friendly Cities Network convener, and hopefully a subject matter expert and perhaps an interstate um, council CEO or executive as well. So stay tuned for more information on that. Excellent. Looking forward to that. And can I give a plug for an upcoming VLGA Connect interview this week? We're very pleased to have the Federal Minister for Local Government, Mark Colton, joining us again to talk about current issues. Terrific. That's excellent. I did mention to David Morris when I caught up to him last with him last week that we had had the Federal Minister for Local Government on the program before, and I've I've extended an invitation to David as well. I think it would be a good opportunity uh, for our viewers to hear from um, the Shadow Minister for Local Government as to what he's identified as some of the priorities for the sector. So look out for that. Governance update coming out on Friday. The Local Government News Roundup podcast Wednesdays and Sundays. And hopefully, Catherine, another newsroom next Monday. Oh, absolutely. And I must say, I forgot to say that I met the new uh, Chief Municipal Inspector over the weekend at the Arguavit conference, and he's really keen also to come on the program and introduce himself to the sector. I thought we might um, co-host that one, Chris. You'd be very welcome. Looking forward to it. All right. So lots to look forward to on VLGA Connect. Thanks for your uh, thoughts on all of those very important issues today, Catherine. Have a great week. And we'll see you again soon in the newsroom. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Chris. See you then. Thanks for your company. See you soon on another episode of VLGA Connect.